hills and mountains. The Bible says in Proverbs 18 and 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruits. Have you ever heard the phrase, you're making a mountain out of a molehill? Yeah? I heard that the other day, and it sparked a thought in me that I want to pursue for the rest of this time that we're this morning. Now, first of all, for those of y'all that know what it means, this is going to be a review, but just in case you don't know what it means, I want to just kind of dissect it for you. First of all, what is a molehill? Well, a molehill is a small mound of ridge of earth or ridge of earth raised up by a mole burying under the ground. Um, it's about the size of an anthill. You ever seen an anthill? Or uh, for those of us that were raised more down south, they have these little crawdad mounds, you know, where the crawdad buries in it. That's kind of what it looks like. It's so that's what a molehill is, all right? So, But one of the things that we can gather from that is it's, it's, it's a little mound, but it's not very big. And then you have a mountain. A mountain is a large landform that rises above the surrounding land in a limited area, usually in the form of a peak. Uh, I had occasions many, many times to go visit my father's uh, homeland, and my father was born in La Paz, Bolivia, and the mountains, it's in the middle of the Andes Mountains, and the city itself is about 13,000 feet in the air. So you have Mile High Stadium. They have two Mile High Stadium, okay? And so when I always joke that when you land, you land at the very top, and then you go down the valley, you don't ever come down. You just kind of land straight across like this. It's so high. Um, but the mountains there are incredibly tall. They're incredibly majestic. If you look at one of those mountains, it makes you uh, uh, kind of drop your mouth in awe and wonder at how God created uh, these magnificent things. But when we're looking at, at these things, you, the, whether it's the scale of a mountain or the smallness of a molehill, what you're finding is that the saying is playing off the disparity between the two. The saying is a metaphor for the common behavior of responding disproportionately to something, usually an adverse circumstance. One who makes a mountain out of a molehill is said to be greatly exaggerating the severity of the situation. So what got me to go down this road when I was thinking about this saying is I, I, I heard it in reverse. I actually was listening to a podcast and they said this saying, and then they said it in reverse, and boom, I just, it, just, it just jumped and leaped off the pages to me. Um, we have the capacity as Christians to either make our molehills into mountains, but we also have the capacity to make our mountains into molehills. It's determined by how we react to the situation that we find ourselves in. Now, when I say we have the capacity, we facilitate. We can't part the sea. Only God can part the sea, Correct. So it's not that you have the capacity within yourself except for the fact that the Lord lives inside of you. But he has given us ways to be able to flow with him, to be able to deal with the circumstances in our life. So the question becomes, do we let that situation that we're facing take an improper position of towering over our trust and faith in God? Or do we begin to put the circumstances we're facing in their place by exercising our authority in Christ over the problems that are in front of us. Everyone goes through problems. Everyone deals with circumstances in life. And sometimes it takes wisdom to know whether I'm supposed to go out uh, around this problem, whether I'm supposed to go through the problem, but sometimes the wisdom of God is to speak to the problem. Jesus was in the middle of a storm with his disciples. Do you remember that? And the winds began to blow, and what began to happen? He was sleeping, and the disciples were frantically, uh, you know, uh, uh, anxious about what was going to happen. They thought they were going to die. They wake him up, thought that he should know that he was about to die. Isn't that funny? Have you ever, have you ever called out in prayer to God and said, God, I think we're really in trouble. I, I, don't, I don't know if you know what to do about this thing, but we're in trouble. And Jesus gets up, and he didn't. He didn't, uh, uh, let's just to use a colloquialism, he didn't freak out about it. What he began to do is he began to face the storm and he get, began to speak to the storm. And when he said, peace, be still, what happened? The storm lifted. The storm moved. And what I'm trying to tell you today is that sometimes in life, we do have the capacity at the leadership of the Holy Spirit to speak to the obstacles, the problems, the circumstances that we all face so that God can move those things out of our way. 
I want to suggest to you that Christ doesn't, does not want us to make mountains out of molehills, but instead he wants us to make molehills out of our mountains. How do we do that? Mark 11, 20 through 2 through 24 says this. Jesus answered his disciples and said to them, have faith in God. Another translation says, have the faith of God. Another translation says, have God-like faith. Truly I say to you that whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Now, let's just 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 I don't have it broken down in my message, but let's just let's just make sure we set the context appropriately. It doesn't mean that you can go speak to anything in the world and have it move because the context is prayer. You're praying to God. And when you're praying to God, what's happening is that you're becoming more into agreement, hopefully, if you're praying correctly, with what the will of God is. And so as you come into line with what the will of God is in your life, then in keeping with the will of God, you can then be sp- begin to speak to the things that are outside of the will of God that they would conform to the will of God. That's why Jesus said, when you pray, pray this way. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Where? On earth, in my life, in my circumstances, where I work, where I go to school, in my family, on earth, let your will be done as it is in heaven. So in other words, it's got to be taking place in heaven for it to be taking place here or to have the precedent for it to be able to take place here. The reason was Jesus was able to speak peace to the storm is because that's what he saw his father doing, speaking peace to the storm. There are other places in the Bible where Jesus walked on the waters that were being blown by the storm, but he didn't speak peace to the storm. Why? Because that's what he saw his father doing. Am I making sense to you? So it's not just saying, hey, this is what I want. I'm going to just speak to these things the way I want. No, the context is that you're harmonizing with heaven. You're in agreement with heaven. You're saying what heaven is saying. Obviously, what that means is that we need to be in a relationship with God, and we need to be in a position where we can know what the will of God is so that we can get into an agreement with the will of God. The thought that I was having, well, I think I mentioned it a little while ago, is Moses at the Red Sea. You remember that Moses, uh, God had used Moses to bring the Israelites out of bondage, and, and the Bible says that he didn't lead them the quick way to get to Egypt, I mean to get to the promised land because they didn't know how to fight yet, but they went out dressed like warriors anyway, but God didn't lead them that way, and it says he kind of led them back around, and he actually le- led them between these two cliffs, and the cliffs, you couldn't go left and you couldn't go right, and he led them to the to the. Um, uh, it would be like going down to Surfside. He led them to the, to the uh, brink of an ocean. And then all of a sudden, the, Isra- the Egyptians decided, hey, we made a mistake. We shouldn't have let these people go. And so the Egyptians come, and they, they back up to them. And so the I- Israelites are surrounded on the left side by, and the right side by cliffs, on the back by, uh, by the Egyptians, and in front of them by an ocean. And they start going after Moses. Moses, you knucklehead, look at what you did. What, what are you thinking? Sorry, I'm, I may be project, projecting myself into Moses. Anyway, uh, but anyway, he says, what are you thinking? And Moses says, i got to pray about this. He goes to God, and he's praying about it to the Lord. And the Lord says to him, why are you talking to me about this? Go stand in front of the ocean. Lift up your staff. And what happened? He went and stood in front of the ocean. What was the ocean? It was his mountain. It was his problem. It was his circumstance. What was the staff of God? The staff of God was the authority of God that God had invested in him. So in some ways, what Moses was doing is he was lifting up the staff. He was speaking to the mountain. Now, I want you to see something here. The staff did not move the ocean. God moved the ocean, but Moses had to do his part. He had to lift up the staff. Am I making sense to you? the same way whenever the Israelites a little bit farther down the road they got into a a battle with the Amalekites who came I think I believe it was the Amalekites who came to uh, basically destroy them before they became a problem and what happened is Moses sent the uh, Joshua and the army to go fight the Amalekites and Moses went up on the mountain it's a good thing he had two people with him he had Ben and he had her no he had Aaron and he had her 
All right? So he's up on the mountain, and one of the things that the Bible teaches us is that every time he lifted up his, his arms and his staff, the Israelites began to win. But when his arms got tired and the arms came down, what happened? The enemy began to win. And so not only did Moses recognize this, but the people that were around it recognized it. And so when his arms got tired, what happened is Ben and Hur, Ben and Jerry, I'm sorry, Ben and Jerry got one on the left, no, Aaron and Hur, and they began to hold up his arms because his arms got tired. And what began to happen? See, why was that important? Because he was facing the problem with the authority of God that God had given him. And when, do, when you do your part, it looses and releases heaven to do its part. We don't fight natural battles by in and of ourselves. It is a supernatural battle that we get to participate in. Are, are you hearing what I'm saying? We have to do our part. As we do our part, it releases God to do his part. Well, let me see if I can get back to where I was, okay? So in these verses, have the faith of God, speak to the mountain. Jesus has given us a principle in these verses that teaches us the importance of not only facing our problems, but speaking in faith to the problems that seek to keep us from walking out our God-given assignments. A lot of times what happens is we, we, we have this false notion that if it's God, it's going to be easy. If it's God, he's just going to open doors and nothing's going to stand in our way. No, sometimes you have to realize that you're in a battle. And if you're in a battle and you have a God-given assignment to accomplish something, you need to expect that there is an enemy who comes to seek, kill, and destroy, and he's going to do everything he can to be able to hinder you from accomplishing that which God has sent you to do. And so what begins to happen is we, we begin to say, well, there's a problem, there's a mountain, there's these things in our way, so therefore it must not be God's will. Instead of recognizing that it is God's will, but for God to move, God has created the scenario in such a way where we've got to do our part, and if we do our part, it releases God to do his part in our life. Okay? He's given us a principle that speaking in faith to the problem, we need to speak in faith to the problem that seeks to keep us from walking out our God-given assignments. In Romans 5 and 17, just to give you the principle that, of the fact that we have authority, the, uh, the Bible says, For if because of one man's trespass, Adam, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the man, Jesus Christ. What does it mean to reign in life? It means that you're not letting life reign over you, but you're taking authority over life. It doesn't mean you don't go through stuff, but that stuff doesn't defeat you. You, have, you find a way of defeating the stuff that's coming into your life, whether it be going around it, going through it, or moving it. You're not going to be overcome by the stuff, but the stuff, uh, you're going to overcome the stuff. Uh, let me let me use a modern uh, a, 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 an example that we all face. Let's say that uh, you know how many of y'all know that God created everything good, right? You know the battle today is uh, you know cocaine that's bad. Well, cocaine is bad, therefore coca must be bad. Coca is the plant that they get cocaine from. Well, that's just not true. There's nothing wrong with coca. The problem is what people do with coca. Same with marijuana. Listen, I'm not for legalizing marijuana or anything like that. I'm not promoting that. I'm just going to give you an example. Marijuana is bad because people smoke it. Well, no, there's nothing evil in marijuana. It's what people do with marijuana. But what you'll find is that in these plants, and really you'll find it in aspirin comes from the bark of a tree, some of the other medicines that we get, they all come from natural products. There are probably some beneficial things in there. But what ends up happening is instead of ruling over the plants, humanity has allowed the plants to rule over them, right? Instead of, uh, instead of using the plants for what God designed us to be, we create a thing where all of a sudden now we get addicted to smoking the plant or to shooting up the plant or whatever it is, and all of a sudden now we are no longer ruling and reigning in life, but we're being ruled over. And it's the same thing with anger or greed. Or all these things, instead of putting those things down and learning to walk without those things uh, influencing us in life, people can let those things overcome them. Lust, pornography, all these things, we allow them to rule over us. And God's desire is not that these things, because sex was created good, but not the perversion of those things to rule over our life but that those things can be freely enjoyed in the context that God gave us, but in the context that we rule over it. 
Am I making sense to you? Everything in life, I'm bringing out a couple of different things for you to understand what we're talking about. God desires that we rule and reign in life, not over people. Please don't misunderstand me. God never created the scenario where people are supposed to rule over people. Now, it doesn't mean that God doesn't give authority to some people that we're supposed to submit to out of honor, but never out of uh, uh, coercion or because I have to. Now, it's different with the government. That's a totally different thing. That's a different kind of authority that God gave the government to make sure that everybody does the right thing. But that was given in a fallen world. The true scenario is before the fall, God desired, he had authority, he had government, but it was never supposed to be over people. It was supposed to be to facilitate God's will in the earth. Anyway, I'm getting off. Let me get back. God created Adam and Eve in the beginning with the authority to rule over the earth, not over people. Obviously, we understand that they lost the authority. In Christ, we see from this verse that God is still wanting humanity to take its God-given place as his ambassadors on this planet to rule and reign over our lives and over our circumstances and our communities and our schools and the places where we live. And we're loosing the will of God into our God-given sphere, whether it be family, church, school, workplace, and by binding the work of the enemy in our God-given spheres. In Matthew 16 and 19, the Bible says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. I like the translation that says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth has already been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth has already been loosed in heaven. That's really the best way to interpret that verse because it's always heaven first. Heaven is not at our beck and call. We're supposed to find out what heaven's doing, and then we come into agreement with heaven. Am I making sense to you? The key to doing this, though, is found in our text in Proverbs. It all centers on how you speak. Do you speak death or do you speak life into your life and circumstances? James 3, 9 through 10 says, With it, the tongue, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. What does God want you doing in your life? If you're going to speak a uh, blessing uh, over the people around you, that's God's desire for your life. If you're going to speak negatively, it's always from the standpoint of against the enemy that's trying to come and trying to steal, kill, and destroy things in people's lives. So you loose God's will to be done, and you bind the work of the enemy. Making sense to you. Jesus teaches us that our tongue, or how you speak, is really a product of what is ruling in your heart. Luke 6, 45, the good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. So what's in your heart is going to come out of your mouth. If you find yourself angry all the time, it's probably because you got anger in your heart. But also, I'm wanting to teach you something different. A lot of times what happens is we get saved, but we don't talk like kingdom. We talk like what we came out of. Because it takes time to transform the way you think to, to a God-like thinking. And so even though we want the good things of God to take place in our life, we're new Christians, we're born-again Christians, we, we're still talking death. We're still talking destruction. We're still talking anger. We're still talking greed. You know, uh, when I'm in the world and somebody hits me, you got to hit him back harder. Right? So you get saved and, and, and somebody hits you, immediately you want to hit him back harder. And that happens at church a lot. It's not supposed to happen at church, but it happens at somebody hits somebody. Well, maybe not necessarily physically, but metaphorically. You hurt me and I'm going to hurt you. But what does the Bible teach? The Bible teaches somebody hits you on the cheek, you turn the other one. The Bible says if somebody uh, despisefully, dis despitefully uses you, what are you supposed to do? Pray for them. Right? So what are you doing? Somebody hits you, and what do you do? You blankety blank. Oh, man, I'm going to get you. I'm going to show you. I'm going to take a knife. I'm going to stab your tires. Well, nobody's. I'm going to get you. And you're a Christian. R what are you doing? You think I'm, I'm, I'm crazy, but, you know, I know people. I know you. You may not necessarily do this, 
but there may be other things to do. I'm going to make you pay. How are you going to make me pay? I'm not going to talk to you. I'm going to sit on the other side of the church. You know, I'm going to I'm going to give you I'm going to give you the eye when you walk by. We have ways of making people pay. Right? We do that. But what what are we doing? We're not speaking life in their circumstances. We're speaking death. We're speaking the enemy's language, not God's language. Am I making sense to you? All right? We have the capacity to speak unbelief, or we have the capacity to speak words of faith by speaking God's word into and over our lives and into our situation. Obviously, you can't speak God's word if you don't know God's word. The Bible says, my people perish for lack of knowledge. Not only do you have to know God's word, you have to know the proper interpretation of God's word. Uh, um, uh, 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 what is the one in Timothy? A workman that needs to not be ashamed. Uh, huh? Study to show thyself approved unto God. Uh, um, a workman that not needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So you not only have to know the word of God, you have to know how to properly use the word of God in the way that God expected it to be used. You say you can use the word of God improperly? Absolutely. The devil did it. Took Jesus up to the mountaintop and he said, the Bible says this, if you jump off, the angels are going to catch you. And Jesus said, that may be what the Bible says, but it's not what the Holy Spirit is speaking. I don't want to speak just a verse that matches my circumstances and gives me the outcome that I want. I want to speak what God is saying. And the Lord is saying at this particular time, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. See, that's what I'm saying. You have to find out what is the Holy Spirit speaking to you in your life. Where is the Holy Spirit leading? What is he highlighting in your life? And once you know that, how did Jesus defeat the enemy? With the word. He didn't speak, oh, you lousy devil, God should have never created you. He didn't say that. He just spoke the word of God. And what happened when he spoke the word of God? The Bible says he left him. He's going to come back at another time, but he, he couldn't have any place in Jesus. Why? Because you can't, uh, the enemy can't fight the word of God. Am I making sense to you? So I know that there are probably some people here that are thinking that I'm, I may be exaggerating the authority we have or maybe even thinking that I'm crossing the line with what we as people can and should do. So I want to illustrate what I'm talking about by using some very common events found in the Bible that I hope will confirm to you what I'm trying to teach you. First one's going to be in the book of Numbers. By the way, these are Old Covenant, how much more important in the New Covenant. But in the book of Numbers, it says, uh, uh, chapter 13, verse 25 through 33. How are we doing up there on the slide? Good? All right. So at the end of 40 days, they returned from spying out the land, and they came to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation of the people. We're talking about the spies that had gone into the land that God, Moses had sent at the behest of God. And the people of Israel in the wilderness of Padan and Kadesh, they brought back word to them, to all the congregation, and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him, we, come, we came to the land to which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. However, the people who dwell in the land are strong, and the cities are fortified and very large. And besides, we saw the descendants of Anak there. What does it mean? The giants. And the Amalekites dwell in the land of the Negev. The Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites dwell in the hill country. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the Jordan. But Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and occupy it, for we are well able to overcome it. And then the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we are. How do they know that? I just feel like they're stronger than us. They have more numbers than us, but that doesn't mean they're stronger than you. So they brought to the people of Israel a bad report of the land that had, they, they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone to spy out is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people that we saw in it are of great height. And there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, who come from the Nephilim, and we seem to ourselves like grasshoppers, and so we seem to them. In other words, how we see ourselves is how they're going to see us as well. And to them, we just like little grasshoppers. You ever been up in a plane and you look outside and you look down and you see these little 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 ants moving along and they're not really ants, they're people? That's what they're really saying. That's how we look to them. What were they speaking? We seem to ourselves like grasshoppers. We're not able. Why? We're, we're too small. They're too big. 
This is what they were speaking in the situation. And as a result of what they were speaking, all of the congregation bought into that, and they began to speak the same thing. And when they began to speak the same thing, all they wanted to do was to leave that place. Are you hearing what I'm saying? As a result of what they were saying and because they believed what they were saying, the people talked themselves out of possessing the inheritance that God had said to them that he was going to give them. This is a case of making a mountain out of a molehill. So I don't know. What if they were giants? You know, they might have been giants from the perspective of a person looking at a stature of a man, but they weren't giants from the perspective of a man standing on the shoulders of God. It all depends on your perspective. It all depends on what you're looking at. But I'm here to tell you that their speech came out of their heart. You see what I'm saying? But what they spoke into the air, what they spoke into their circumstances was not faith and trust in God, but it was doubt and unbelief and an unwillingness to be able to go in because they didn't see any way where they could accomplish it. In 1 Samuel 17, we're going to look at another example. 1 Samuel 17, verse 11, the Bible says, When Saul and all Israel heard the words of the Philistine, Goliath, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. So I want you to see this. The Israelites had lined up for battle with the Philistines. And for 40 days they had been lined up for battle. So well, why didn't they fight? Israel always fought the enemies of God. They've been defeating the enemies of God. What made this different? What made it different was that this time the Philistines came up with a giant. And when they call him a giant, he was like, we're going to guess nine feet tall and maybe about, uh, you know, six, five or six feet wide. He's pretty, you know, Andre the Giant type thing. And he comes out and he says to them, hey, you pick your best man and I'm going to be the Philistines best man. And we're not all going to fight. We're just going to, you know, you're just going to fight your best man and my best man and the one who wins. That's the one that's going to, yeah, you know, the other the other army is going to bow down to the army that wins. Well, anyway. What happened was, for 40 days, the Israelites were cowering in fear. 1 Samuel 17, 32 through 33, same chapter, a little farther down. David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, you're not able to go up against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth, and he has been a man of war from his youth. But I want you to see what it says here. See, that Goliath had affected the Israelites with his words of fear and his stature, and the Israelites had begun to believe these words of fear and unbelief. And so when David showed up, he had a different spirit, but the king told David probably what they had been speaking for the last 40 days, we are not able to. And you're not able to. So what are they trying to infect him with? The words of fear and Unbelief. What were they speaking into the environment? Words of fear and unbelief. Because of those words of fear and unbelief, what were they unwilling to do? To go up against and fight Goliath. Now, I need to bring this out, okay? I need you to understand that it's not just the speaking. It's what you do in keeping with the speaking. Okay? You have to speak God's word into the situation that you're in, but you also have to do something. You can't just pray and not do something. Faith without works is dead. You show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. So David could come in, and he could say, Oh, man, you don't have to worry about it. God's going to take care of that giant and never do anything. And you know what's going to happen? Nothing. Nothing's going to take place. So, yes, it's important what you speak, but what's going to happen is when you speak words of faith into your life, you're going to start moving in keeping with faith. When you speak words of doubt and unbelief into your circumstances and the environment, you're going to begin to move in agreement with those words of doubt and unbelief. Am I making sense to you? All right, I need you to go every once in a while. We're going to, at some point, we're going to get a camera, and I'm going to show you guys while I'm preaching what you look like. I preach better if you flow with me. Even if you say no, I'll preach better. Because I'm going to show you why you're wrong. No, just kidding. All right, 
When David showed up with a different spirit, the king himself told David he was not able to fight with the Philistines. Why? I believe that's what they've been speaking for the last 40 days. I suggest to you that this is why no one had gone up to face him before. For 40 days they had been rehearsing and speaking the same words to each other. You're not able to fight with this Philistine. And as a result, for 40 days, there was no sign of victory over the enemies that were invading the territory of God's people. This enemy was now holding sway in the land that God had given Israel authority to rule over. Their sphere was being influenced by an enemy that was creating fear and unbelief and doubt. And as a result of that, they were cowering and not um, walking in all that God had for them to walk in. All right, now I want to go over these two illustrations again, but I want to show you them from the standpoint of someone who was speaking in opposite spirit. Okay? Now let's go back and view these stories from a different perspective. Let's look at them through the through the through those who spoke words of faith into the same circumstances that others were speaking words of unbelief into. In Numbers 13, 25 through 30, we're going back to Caleb and Joshua and the spies. Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and occupy it, for we are well able to overcome it. Now, why were they well able to overcome it? Their military might was not going to overcome it. It wasn't going to be their military prowess. What was it that Caleb understood that was going to help them to overcome? It was not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Our God that brought us out of Egypt, this is what was going on in Caleb's mind, the same God that delivered us through Egypt, the same God that fed us for, for all this time in the wilderness with manna from heaven, the same God that opened up a rock that allowed us to be able to drink water, the same God that provided us with quail, not just one million people one time, but for 30 days, he gave us so much quail, we didn't want quail anymore. This same God told us that he would go with us into this land and if he's going to go with us, who can stand against us? Caleb, let us go up at once and occupy it, for we are well able to overcome it. Why? Because God is with us. So what ended up happening to Caleb? By the way, I should say that the Israelites ended up uh, wandering in the wilderness because they walked in the words of un uh, unbelief and doubt for, four, for 38 years. The Bible kind of rounds it out and says 40 years. And that whole generation died, except Joshua and Caleb. The Bible says in Numbers 14, 24, My servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit and has followed me fully, I, it doesn't say he, I will bring him into the land in which he went, and his descendants shall possess it. What was his different spirit? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. If God be for us, who can stand against us? No weapon formed against us shall prosper. No tongue that is raised shall stand. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Because he spoke words of life and faith and belief and trust in who God was and what God can do. He ended up possessing not only the land, but his children and his children's children were able to possess that which God led Caleb into. And I want to suggest something to you today, that your life is just not little a little blip in history. Your life is not just you, but everybody that's coming after you. There are battles that you're going to be facing. There are wars that God's going to lead, lead you into, but it's not so that you can be defeated but so that you can overcome and in the victory that God gives you it's not just for you it's for your children and your children's children and the children that come after that God wants to lead you to possess an inheritance that he wants not only you to possess but all those that come into an inheritance because of who you are because they're related to you am I making sense to you did you know that the Israelites that came after David, they inherited something because of what David did and who David was? Well, so that's pretty good, but what about us? Do you know that we live today and walk in the abundance and the grace and the blessings of God today because of what our big brother Jesus did at the cross of Calvary? 
Yes, I know he's the son of God, but he's also part of us. He's humanity. He's our, he's our big brother. He's the eldest in the family. Do you know that God also wants your children and children's children and all those that come after that to experience the blessings of the inheritance that you're able to possess because of the life that you live? It's not just for me. The blessings, wherever you have authority, whatever sphere God has put you into, the victories that you win are not just for you. They're for those that come after you. I, I hope I'm helping you to understand that. You say, well, what's the use? What's the purpose? I just want to get to heaven. This is the reason why you don't want to just get to heaven. You do want to get to heaven, yes, but God wants more for you than to just get to heaven. He wants to bring heaven here on this earth through you. How do you know that maybe in your family line, let's use something pretty innocuous. Let's just say in your family line that you've struggled with diabetes. Everybody in your family has diabetes. Bam, 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 bam. All throughout. You go to the doctor. Have your grandma, yeah, my grandma. How's your grandma? Yeah, my grandfather. Have, you know, blah, blah, blah. okay, your children, are, you're high risk, all these kind of things. And, and, you know, pretty much everybody in your family, that's just the way it is. And we all know how to use insulin. We all know how to take. We, that, it's just we're, that's what we're used to. And then all of a sudden you're reading the Word of God, and the Word of God says that Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit and power, and he went around doing good, healing all those that were oppressed of him, for God was with him. And you begin to believe God, and you begin to pursue God, and you begin to contend God for that victory. And yes, I love it when the victory comes like that, but sometimes you got to dip in the river seven times. Sometimes you got to go, and you got to go on the mountain and pray seven times. Sometimes you got to contend for that which God won for you at the cross of Calvary. You're not contending with God. You're contending with the circumstances. You're contending with the enemy. You say, well, what, what are you saying? Well, I'm, but you're not just contending for your victory. Maybe that when you get a victory over diabetes, God does such a work in you that your DNA is changed. And you not only change your life, but from that point on, nobody in your family ever has to battle that demon of diabetes. Because you were willing to contend for that thing. Am I making sense to you? That's what God is teaching us here with Caleb. You are going to possess the land, and your descendants are going to possess the land. Hallelujah. What about the account of David and Goliath? How did David speak to the situation? When the words that David spoke were heard, it says in 1 Samuel 17, 31 through 37, they repeated them before Saul, and he sent for him, and David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant, he's, you've got to remember, he can't be about 15 to 16, 17 years old. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. I want you to notice what David never does. You will never find one time in this chapter that David ever calls him a giant. He calls him a Philistine or he will call him an uncircumcised Philistine. And Saul said to David, you are not able to go up against this Philistine to fight with him for you are but a youth and he has been a man of war from his youth. Thank God that David did not embrace those words of unbelief. What did David begin to speak? But David said to Saul, see, Saul had something to say to David, but David had something to say to Saul. He said, your servant used to keep sheep for his father, and when there came a lion or a bear uh, and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him. He didn't say, I just prayed about it. No, I went after him. I believed God, and I struck him, and I delivered it out of the mouth, uh, out of, the mouth of the lion and the bear. And if he came up against me, I caught him by his beard, and I struck him, and I killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine, he's going to be just like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Now find me a good tent where I can hide in. Is that what he said? No. No. The Bible says they let him go, and he went to a brook, and he took out five smooth stones. And you know, you've heard the preachers say, one for Goliath and the rest of them for these other giant brothers. But the reality is he was doing in the natural what he knew to do. He knew how to use a slingshot, didn't use how to know how to use a sword, didn't know how to use a sh shield. He knew how to use a slingshot. But what I want you to know is he went and got the rocks, and he took that slingshot, and he started running toward the problem. 
He didn't run away from the problem. He ran toward the problem. And what did he say to Goliath? I wish I'd have put it down in here. Let me, let me find that. It's in 1 Samuel 17. I want to show you what he said to, to, uh, what he said to Goliath. This is what made David, David. When the Philistine or, the, or Goliath looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy with a handsome appearance. The Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine also said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the sky and the beasts of the field. And David said to the Philistine, You hear what I'm saying? The enemy is always saying stuff to us. You're going to die young. You're going to get Alzheimer's. You're going to get a tumor. You're going to get cancer. Your family's never going to serve God. You're going to, the enemy's always saying stuff to us. It's time for a David to rise up and say, you have something to say, but I have something to say too. And what did he say? The Bible says David said to the Philistine, David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword and sphere and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts and the God of the armies of Israel whom you have taunted. This day the Lord will deliver you up into my hands and I will strike you down and remove your head from you and I will give the dead bodies of the army of the Philistines this day to the birds of the sky and the wild beasts of the earth that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel and that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not deliver by sword or by spear for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Is there a man or a woman of God that will stand up today and say, enough is enough. I've been feeding on your lies, listening to your lies, buying your lies, but I'm tired of it. No more. I choose this day to trust in the Lord my God. And now I know that God doesn't work without me. God works with me. And if there's somebody willing to stand on His Word and willing by faith to move with God, God will give me that demon. God will give me that giant. God will move that storm. Why? Because I don't come in the name. I'm with sword and stone. I come in the name of the Lord my God. And if God be for me, you cannot and shall not and will not stand against me. I told myself I wasn't going to get excited this morning. What I want you to see is that we can choose to speak words of death or we can choose to speak words of life. How do we get there? How do I be more like Caleb and David? Well, remember what I said before, to change your outer world, you must change your inner world. The God in you must become bigger to you than the world outside of you. It wasn't that Goliath was not big. It was that the God that rested on David was bigger. You know what I'm saying? It's kind of like, it's kind of like, let's say Sharon, let's just say in the natural, Sharon's mad at me and she says, I'm going to bring my husband out. He's going to get you and he's going to whoop you. And she brings Joe in the natural, and when Joe, you know, obviously when Joe was younger, he was big, strapping guy. And I look at him, and I can go, oh, I messed up. But if she brings Joe out, I don't have to worry, because my brother is Andre the Giant. My brother's Dave Bautista. My brother's bigger than him. You know, you know what I'm saying? So the enemy comes, and he brings the best he can do, which is Goliath. But when I come, I bring the best that God can do. And he's the captain of the Lord of hosts. When he comes, he doesn't just come alone. He brings everything he is and all that he has with him. And that's why that God would tell David, I mean, David, when he went to battle later on in life, when David went to battle, he, be, he was ordained as king. The Bible says that David, he was already king. He knew the job description. He knew what he was supposed to do. He was supposed to keep the Israelites safe, just like our president today, whoever it may be. He's supposed to keep our nation safe. And so the Philistines come to invade the land. Well, I know what my job description, I'm going up and I'm going to fight him. But that's not what David did. 
David said, bring me the, bring me the ephod and had the Urim and the thumb, and then that was the way they determined what the will of God was. And he prayed, and he said, God, do you want me to go up against the Philistines? And God said, yes. And so David got into an agreement with God, and he went out against the Philistines, and he defeated them. But here's what I want you to see. The next time the Philistines come up again, David didn't say, well, God already said yes last time. I know what to do. No, he went to the Lord, and he said, God, do you want me to go out again, again against the Philistines? And God said, no. I do want you to go out against them, but not like before. Before you went up straight against, straight in front of them. This time I want you to go around back. And I want you to wait until you hear the sound of rustling in the mulberry trees is what it says in the King James Version. What was happening, the, the key to all the victories that David uh, encountered and David was able to, to lead his army into was David did not fight alone. You see, what was happening is when the wind began to rustle in the trees, the, 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 the angels of God were going first. So David was not fighting a natural battle. He was fighting a supernatural battle. And too often what happens is we stand up in the Lord trying to fight a natural battle with natural means. But we don't need to do that. We need to learn a lesson from David. We need to go to the Lord, find out what the will of God is. And when we find the will of God, follow the will of God, speak the will of God. And when you do, you're not fighting just a natural battle. You're fighting a supernatural battle with a supernatural armament. It's all about God. But what we do facilitates how God can and will move into our life. And what I'm saying to you is that in order to begin to see this way, you've got to change your inner world. The God in you must become bigger than the world outside of you. To do this, you've got to learn to focus on Him. You've got to spend time with Him. You've got to spend time in His Word. Don't just read the Word, but let the Word of God read you. Let faith rise up in you and begin to speak words of life. Begin to speak his word by faith into the circumstances that you're, faith, that you're facing. And let me just clarify this. It's not faith in what you can do. It's not even faith in faith, but faith in God and what God can and will do. Speak to the mountains in the name of the Lord and watch those mountains become molehills. Romans 10 and 17. Faith comes by hearing. And hearing through the word of Christ. I want to hold for just a moment. 